الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بالسنة إلى يوم الدين <coughs> الحمد لله All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day in our previous uh, lecture we completed the fundamentals of hadith methodology and we now go on to usul al-fiqh or the fundamentals of Islamic law and as I explained in the very beginning all of these topics that we have taken so far are all interrelated the foundation of Islam is aqidah is belief in Allah tawheed and information about Allah comes to us primarily from the Quran so we studied tafsir but the Quran cannot be understood without resorting to the explanations of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for it to be properly understood we must go to the sunnah and we said that the sunnah was conveyed to us in the hadith the hadith is the container for the sunnah therefore we studied the science of hadith and then we dis when we discussed the principles of tafsir and we talked about understanding the Quran in its context as explained in the sunnah by the Prophet Muhammad as further clarified to us by his companions who lived the revelation and resorting to Arabic language and that is classical Arabic language where there remained bits and pieces which were not specifically clarified by Prophet Muhammad nor by his companions and after that we said we use our opinion to apply the Quran to our daily lives and the application of the Quran and the Sunnah to our daily lives this is what is known as fiqh fiqh Islamic law and that's why we now begin the study of Islamic law so there is a progression here though we have studied three other topics and this is the fourth of the major topics they are all interrelated one builds on the other they combine to form the fourth Islamic law the term Islamic law has been used as a translation for both the term fiqh which I mentioned as well as the term sharia ah. but to the specialists they are not synonymous to the non-specialist they would appear to be synonymous if we translate sharia ah as Islamic law fiqh as Islamic law then sharia ah must be the same as fiqh but the fact of the matter is that they're not the Sharia ah translated into English is the water hole or the straight path fiqh is understanding a deep understanding as Prophet Muhammad said may yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fiddin whomsoever Allah wishes for that individual good 
He gives him a deep understanding of the religion. This is the fiqh. So, having understood it from a linguistic point of view, what is intended by Sharia is Islamic law as contained in Revelation. Meaning, Islamic law as it is contained in the Quran and the Sunnah. This constitutes Sharia. Whereas, the human understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah and its application in daily life, this is now what we call fiqh. So, fiqh, we could call it applied Islamic law because it will rely on the Quran and Sunnah but human understanding is there whereas Sharia is divine revelation human understanding has no place there so if we look at fiqh and Sharia we can find that there are basically three differences between the two. First and foremost, Sharia is based on divine revelation, fiqh is based on human understanding. Secondly, Sharia, because it is based on divine revelation, the laws of Sharia are fixed. They are fixed, unchangeable. Whereas the laws of fiqh, because they are deduced from human understanding, they are flexible. They can change. Thirdly, a point of content, the laws of sharia in general tend to be general whereas the laws of fiqh tend to be very detailed and very specific why because the human circumstances which would arise in our daily lives are so many the rulings that have to be deduced for all of the circumstances of our lives then become multi uh, varied you know and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to address each and every little change that, and difference that takes place in human lives in the Quran in detail in specific we would end up with an encyclopedia of 40 or 50 volumes which would make the Quran very impractical you couldn't take it around with you memorizing it now would become a real challenge I mean so for practical purposes the essence of the revelation was preserved in a basic text which spoke about the general principles clarification of those principles and additional general principles were provided by the Sunnah but now applying it to each and every change in human life that is now left up to human beings and this is where the test of life comes after you have understood what the Quran and the Sunnah has to say, will you apply it? This is your test. And when we look, as we said, at the basic uh, foundation of the Islamic legal system, we can say it is based on 
Quran and Sunnah on one hand, and it's based on human understanding on the other hand. These are combined. And what is important for us to deduce or to take from this difference is the Dawah point. That when non-Muslims raise the question, how in the world can you Muslims dare to suggest that you want to rule your lives and the lives of your countries by a legal system revealed 1,400 years ago. How could you possibly suggest this? This is insane. How could you possibly imagine that it could be applicable today? Why? Because when they look at their own legal systems, the Magna Carta, you know, the Declaration of Rights, the American Constitution, the, the various documents that have been produced, you know, in the last 500 years, less than 500 years, 200 years, they, though on one hand, may contain certain good principles which we can accept today, they also contain grave errors like that famous error in the American Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, where it was referred to as the three-fifths comp compromise, right? where black Americans were to be considered according to the American Constitution 1776 put together by the best and most liberated minds of that time. Black Americans were to be considered as three-fifths of white Americans. That is enshrined in the Constitution. You can make your pilgrimage to Washington and go and see it there written in the document. So this obvious racist oppressive principle was incorporated in a document which was to guide you know the society's life etc so they could see that and if you go to the Magna Carta you go to the other documents produced in Europe in France in Germany in England etc you find many other things actually the American Constitution is way ahead of those others because those are older so they know to try to apply the legal systems of 200 years ago, much less 500 years ago, is ludicrous. So now when we say not 500, but 1,400 years, they say you must be insane. That legal system must contain so much that is totally inapplicable today. And not only that, it becomes also rigid and inflexible, you know, like societies like the Amish, right, where you have these ancient uh, Christian groups that had developed in Europe and then they fled persecution in Europe to America and they arrived there like in the 16th century and so and they're still locked into the 16th century they still drive around in buggies they don't use electricity they're still dressing the same way they dressed all these kind of things locked so that's what they perceive application of the sharia as being like okay you muslims you still want to do all this cover-up thing praying the same way going back to the past and being locked into the past. Can't possibly be applicable to modern society. However, we have also fiqh, which provides the flexibility making Islamic law with its inflexible foundation applicable in any place, in any time. And I know personally, uh, 
in the case of my own father who I had asked to edit a book which I wrote called The Evolution of Fiqh of the schools of fiqh schools of Islamic law the evolution of fiqh I asked him to edit it for me because he's a, an English uh, professor so he went through it and he edited it in fact the last chapter of the book he wrote my book Evolution of Fiqh which is quite detailed he wrote the last chapter and he's a very good editor but he said after reading it you know he was amazed he said I didn't have the slightest inkling that Islamic law was so developed. I mean that this thing really was a complete system because he was thinking, you know, Islam like Christianity, you know, you had legal systems, but it was dependent on the existing uh, Roman or Greek systems and it's just given a Christian coat, right? Whereas it's the Islamic system was had its own unique foundation and it was so developed as to address all aspects of human need you know he was just amazed at it so this is our point of defense that Islam is applicable anywhere the foundational principles found in the Quran and the Sunnah, these address issues which do not change in human life. <clears throat> human beings are the same human beings they were a thousand years ago, five thousand years ago, fifty thousand years ago. They were human beings. We don't believe at any time in the past there were monkeys who finally got out of the trees and decided to walk upright. Right? We don't believe that. Human beings were always human beings. And the emotional, psychological, economic, physical needs of human beings have not changed. Yes, society has evolved, so how we meet those needs might change but the basic needs don't change so Allah when he revealed the laws in the Quran and through the Sunnah he addressed those basic needs which never change then the fiqh aspect is for us to deal with those changing aspects of human society and apply Islamic law according to need. So if we look at Islamic law and how we would apply it. As we approach tafsir the first thing we do is we go to the Quran. We have an issue that we need to determine and establish a law for we go to the Quran first and foremost. And if we find a law there, can we say, Alhamdulillah, we've got the law here in the Quran, this is what we will apply, no need to go to the Sunnah. Can we say that? Can we stop here? Is that possible? Tell me. No? Correct. No. It has been mistakenly taught that you go to the Quran, if you find the law in the Quran, finish. No need to go further. If you don't find it in the Quran, then you go to the Sunnah. This is a mistake. When you find it in the Quran, you must go to the Sunnah to get the Prophet's clarification of it. You must go there. You cannot stop. Because if we do that, there are many laws in the Quran which have been clarified, the details of which have been clarified in the Sunnah. If you applied it as it existed in the Quran, you would be applying it incorrectly. For example, 
if we take the laws of food in the Quran it states there what are the forbidden foods the animals that are killed by a blow and they fall and all of this listing and pork then Allah says after that and whatever is beyond that is halal so it means we can eat tigers and lions eagles and if you take that Quranic text and you could argue that however Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said let us not find one of you reclining on a couch holding up the Quran saying whatever I find halal in here I will make halal and whatever I find haram in here I will make haram bas only because as the Prophet ﷺ said, I made things halal and I made things haram which are not found in the book. Meaning that he provided details, further clarification. He is the one who told us we cannot eat domesticated donkeys. Allah said, cut off the hand of the thief. In Arabic, yad can be from your fingertip to your wrist, or from your fingertip to your elbow, or from your fingertip to your armpit. All of that is called yad. So according to us and the Quran, technically if you steal, we can cut off your arm all the way up to your armpit. Furthermore, if what you stole was my pencil, I could also chop off your arm all the way up to your armpit for stealing my pencil. Whereas the Sunnah clarifies that the cutting of the hand is only to the wrist. The Sunnah clarifies that you don't cut off the hand for anything whose value is less than somewhere around a hundred dollars. Not just for any little thing. Yes, you may punish that person for stealing who's, something whose value is less than the hand cutting value, but you don't cut the hand. So, the steps are not independent steps. The Quran and the Sunnah have to come together. We cannot separate them. And we spoke about that before. Just as we said that the Shahada, our declaration of faith, consists of two aspects. La ilaha illallah, there is no God worthy of worship but Allah, the Quran, and Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the sunnah. Our belief depends on accepting both. So, if we find the law in the Qur'an, we go to the Sunnah to get clarification of the details concerning that law. If we don't find the law in the Qur'an, we go to the Sunnah to try to find the law. Either way, we go to the Sunnah after going to the Qur'an. Yes, we'll go to the Qur'an first. Why? Because it is the most primary source of revelation. Yes, there is priority. Qur'an is ahead of the Sunnah. But it being ahead doesn't mean you can work with it to the exclusion of the Sunnah. No. Now, Whenever the companions, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, ran into a problem in the time of Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, when they ran into problems, and the Prophet Muhammad was no longer around, they would gather the leading companions and ask them, do you have 
Or do you know of any verses from the Quran which relate to this problem? Then they would ask, do you know of any hadith, any statements of the Prophet ﷺ to this effect? As in the case of inheritance of the grandmother. There is no mention of inheritance of the grandmother. Or in the case of maintenance for a woman who has been divorced irre irrevocably. She has three divorce pronouncements. Is she maintained during her idda or not? This is not in the Quran. So when these issues arose, it was brought to Abu Bakr and to Omar, and they asked, some companion came up and said, Prophet Muhammad had told us that the grandmother inherits like the mother. If there's no mother, then the grandmother will inherit. And in the case of maintenance for the woman who is irrevocably divorced, Fatima bint Qais, one of the female companions of the Prophet who had been irrevocably divorced, she came forth and said, I asked the Prophet concerning maintenance for myself, and he informed us that there is no maintenance. So, this was what they would do. Now, if after that there were still issues, which they could not find in the Qur'an or the Sunnah, what to do then? They would gather and each person who had a suggestion, a possible solution, would make his or her suggestion. And if they all agreed upon it, then this became law. This process of coming together, agreeing upon a ruling, this is called ijma. Ijma. Now, a person may question, what is the difference between ijma and democracy? Sounds like democracy here. And didn't you say that Islam was opposed to democracy? If you didn't hear me say it, I do say it. Okay? Islam is opposed to democracy. So what's the difference? It sounds like democracy. They're getting together, the majority opinion that has been agreed upon, it became law. Isn't that what democracy says? Isn't that what happens in democracy? Well, the difference, and there are major differences. People coming together and agreeing upon something, Islam is not against that. In fact, Prophet Muhammad related to us from the Quran, the verse in which Allah said, Wa amruhum shura bainahum. And their affair is by consultation amongst them. So the idea of consulting together and agreeing upon things and making decisions, this is part of Islam. But, what is the difference then? The difference lies first and foremost in the source of the opinions. Where do the opinions come from? In the case of democracy, Opinions can come from anywhere. They are not rooted in any particular tradition, any precedence. They're not rooted. They don't have to be. If homosexuals put enough pressure on the society, then we can take opinions from the homosexuals. Even though all of the laws prior to that time were opposed to homosexuality, but because homosexuals now exert pressure on the society, all of a sudden laws are being made in favor of homosexuals which have no precedence. When we 
look at Islamic law and how people come together uh, in ijma to come to decisions, that is not the case. All of those decisions which they made by ijma had a source in the Quran or the Sunnah or both. They may not have been direct statements, but they were deducible statements, deducible concepts. So it had a root. Also, the laws of democracy are or, and can, can be primary laws. They can cancel, cancel the laws that were there before them because any, no law has sanctity. No law has sanctity. Meaning that that law was there saying such and such a thing is prohibited. They can get together, agree that it's not. Any law. Nothing is above change. Everything, as they say, is relative. The truth is relative. Good and evil are relative. One man's meat is another man's poison. This is the basis of democratic thought. So therefore, what was pronounced prohibited, pronounced pornography, pronounced immoral, all these things can, in the stroke of a pen, in the instant of a decision, be reversed completely. Be reversed completely. So that means you have no moral foundation for that civilization. No moral foundation. This is why the judgment with regards to human uh, sexual interaction is governed by the principle of consenting adults as opposed to tradition regarding adultery, fornication, that these things are forbidden by divine revelation, etc., etc. That has no relevance because that democratic society functions from a secular base, a base which does not recognize religion as having any role to play in education or state policy. It has no place. Therefore, they deduced other principles. So, Islamic uh, decisions made by Ijma, they were done f using the instrument or the deductive tool of what came to be known as Qiyas. Qiyas, deduction by way of analogy. That is, you have an issue you want to deal with, you go back in the Quran and the Sunnah, you find some law which has a reason similar to the one you are trying to deduce a law for. When you have established similitude, you then transfer that law from the Quran and Sunnah to the circumstance that you wish to deal with. This we refer to as Qiyas. Now, there are examples given in the notes of laws from the Quran and laws from the Sunnah and how they differ really pointing out in general that the Quranic laws tended to be more general and the prophetic uh, hadithic laws tended to be more detailed giving more details about them 
And we know in the case of Salah, that Allah in the Quran only tells us, establish the Salah, aqim is Salah. But He doesn't give us the details of saying takbir, going into rukur, how you go into rukur, how you make sujood, what you should say in sujood. Taslims, not even mentioned at all. Yes, the term rukur is mentioned in the Quran, sujood is mentioned in the Quran, but taslim, not mentioned. Takbir, not mentioned. So, much of the salah, in fact, 90% of the salah, the methodology of salah, can only be found in the sunnah. That is the evidence for us, sufficient. That the laws of the Quran in general tend to address general instructions or be general instructions, whereas the sunnah tends to give us the details of how these instructions are to be followed out. Now, the laws of the Qur'an, when we go into how they were taught by Allah, if we look at the body of information in the Qur'an, Scholars divided it up into three areas. The first being information related to belief in Allah. Aqeedah. The angels, the scriptures, the prophets and so on and so. This is Aqeedah. The second area deals with actions of the heart moral principles, rules of conduct. And this they refer to as ilmul akhlaq or ethics, ethical issues. And the third major area has to do with actions of our body parts, what we do in terms of uh, how we interact on an economic level, how we interact on a social uh, level, which have to do with trade and things of this nature. This is the area of the laws, the, all of the uh, laws governing our, what we call mu'amalat, or human interactions which are not specifically of ethical concern, but what is right and wrong in terms of what we can buy and sell and how we buy and sell and these kind of things. Now, out of that third category, we find that the laws uh, addressing human actions, some of them address man's relationship with Allah and these are our ritual acts of worship the prayer, zakah, fasting, hajj, etc. and the others relate to human interactions, how human beings deal with other human beings and they constitute the laws concerning family trade, criminal law, and jihad, propagation of Islam, etc. Now when we look at the basis of legislation in Islam, whether Quranic or Hadithic revelation, the body of Islamic law which came to Arabia, taught by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu through the Qur'an and the Sunnah. This body of law did not come and erase all of the traditions which existed in the society and replace them with a complete new and different set of laws. 
No. Because that implies that human beings are incapable of arriving at anything correct. That's what it implies. Or that human beings of the past ever arrived at anything correct which they handed down and people may have maintained. That's what it implies. And this is not the case. So what you find is that Islamic legislation did not come to eradicate what was there but to correct it, to reform it, to improve it. Where there were practices and principles which were completely wrong from its core like burying baby girls alive. Okay. There's no reformation of that. That just has to be stopped. Period. Those errors, those mistakes that societies fall into, well, yes, Islam seeks to eradicate them completely. Whereas, there are other practices which were introduced by earlier prophets, but in time these practices became corrupted, like Hajj. When Prophet Muhammad uh, began to teach Islam in Mecca, Hajj was there. The Arabs used to come from all over Arabia and they made Hajj. But how did they make Hajj? They made Tawaf of the Kaaba stark naked. When they slaughtered the animals, they splashed the blood over themselves and they splashed it on the wall of the Kaaba and on their idols. So Islam came and said, okay, yes, tawaf should be done, but not start naked. No, you wear ihram. You wrap something around your waist and something over your shoulders. Right? And when you slaughter the animal, you cook the food, the meat, you eat some of it and you give away some. No need to splash it over yourself and splash it on the car. No, no. Because the blood and the meat does not go to Allah. It is the piety with which we make these sacrifices which goes to Allah. So, in this case, in the case of practices which were handed down from uh, earlier uh, prophets, these were corrected where corruption creeped in. Furthermore, there were practices which human beings arrived at just through rational thinking. They just thought about this issue or this practice and they said, this is good for us to do, so let us do it. There is no specific revelation we can say, he said, do this. It was just a custom which developed in an area wherein it was good. The people got benefit from it. Such customs Islam does not eradicate unless these customs contradict Islamic principles. Where the custom contradicts Islamic principles, yes, you must remove it. Where it doesn't, you can keep it. It doesn't necessarily become a requirement for people to do, but something which is permitted for people to do. Thirdly, If there were areas where the people had a void, they had no teachings or no instructions, then yes, Islamic law came and filled that void. So the Islamic legislative system was reformatory. It, was a, it reformed society, it brought things in order, it did not seek to destroy to replace everything. No. It sought to correct. Remove those things which are evil 
those things which are connected uh, to shirk, things which are against Islamic teachings, it corrects those things, those practices. And it fills the void where there is a need. And what you see, when you look at the characteristics of Islamic law, you find in there that there is the principle of removal of difficulty is fundamental. So many of the laws either correct certain practices and remove certain obligations that were there and provide people with an easier mode, or whenever Allah gives an instruction, He also gives modified versions to deal with, to use in times of difficulty. Just like fasting, when you're traveling, you're excused. Salah, when you're traveling, reduced. Right? All of the major principles we see, all of the instructions, the, a Release valve is always there. Allah prohibits us from eating pork. Period. But if you are starving to death, you are allowed to eat enough to survive. That is the nature of Islamic law. You need to make wudu. But there is no water. Tayammum. You need to pray to Mecca, but you have no compass. If you can see the sun, you can figure out where north is, south is, east and west. And Prophet Muhammad said to his companions in Medina, because they didn't have compasses, he said to them, Medina being to the north, of Mecca, he said, what is between the east and the west, facing south, is Qibla for you. What is between the east and the west, is Qibla for you. مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ قِبْلَةً لَكُمْ That is enough. The ease is there. So, if 20 years ago or 50 years ago a masjid was built in your community and to the best of your ability you turn and set up the masjid facing what appeared to you to be the direction of Qibla which according to the flat map is south east then MSA came along some years later and they said, well, you know, actually, this flat map is not the way to figure out where uh, Mecca is. You have to go according to the globe. And if you take a string from America and you put it to Mecca on a globe, the shortest distance is northeast. Now you have set up your masjid, everything is set up in this way. Do you now have to come and realign everything so your rows which were uh, complete when you faced southeast now become incomplete and broken and all no you don't have to if you decide to do it you can but it is not a requirement it is enough that you face the direction, the general direction, within 180 degrees, that is sufficient. It's an important principle, because you have people who come through, you know, if you have ever lived in an area where you've had your masters for a long period of time, and different groups and people come through, you know, after this northeast thing, came the Qibla compasses. You know, people will come through now and they put the compass on the ground after you've gone and lined up things according to MSA. And they say, hey, you're three degrees off. You know, so, okay, here we go again. Shift the lines another three degrees. 
Then somebody comes along and they bring a new compass, the most advanced version of the compass. And they say, oh, you're still four degrees off. So here we go again. The reality is that if we miss the Qibla by 0 0.0001 degree from here, we have missed the Kaaba by miles. We are not required to go to that depth of accuracy. The only time that we need to be on the Kaaba, right? Exactly, is when we're in Mecca and we see the Kaaba. This is the time when it is haram for you to face any other direction. Haram, your salah is not accepted. If you see the Kaaba in front of you and you pray to the left, your salah is nullified. Other than that, the general direction is sufficient. What about Amir Sultan, the Saudi prince who went up in the space shuttle? Seven days he was circling the earth. And according to what he said, he prayed his five times daily prayer. Whilst he was up there. Hmm? This is Islam. What do you think he was, how, how do you think he was facing the Kaaba? <laughs> okay. What about when we get to the moon? Muslims, if we, people, Muslim, uh, human beings ever colonize the moon and Muslims set up a community up there, what are they going to do? You see, Islam is practical. The difficulty has been removed. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he prayed in Medina when there was no rain, no circumstance or need for him to join prayers he prayed Zuhur and Asr together and prayed Maghrib and Isha together in Medina he wasn't traveling and the companions explained and this is in Sahih Muslim he explained that the Prophet ﷺ did that to remove haraj or difficulty from the Ummah so this is an option that we have where you find yourself in a situation, you leave the house, you've got something you have to go and do, and you know you will not be able to get to a masjid or get to a place where you can pray Asr on time, you're going to miss it. What you do is, before you leave, you pray your Asr along with your Zuhur. You pray Zuhur first, when you finish, you pray Asr. You're a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon. You've got a five hour operation ahead of you. You're starting at Zuhur time. You cannot, when Asr time comes, stop the operation and say, hold on for a minute, let me go make my Asr and I'll come back and join you. Hey, that person may be dead. You know, this operation is a continual thing, you have to stay on it. So, Islam has provided that ease you can join the prayers so we don't have any excuse where you have people for example praying their five times daily before the, before they go to bed they don't pray all day long the time just before they go to bed they get down and pray out five prayers and then they go to sleep no this is not Islam this is not Islam yes there is ease but it is not according to our own desire we just do it anyhow no there are principles here. There are principles. So, in every area of Islamic law, where there are prohib prohibitions, there are strict orders, there is also ease. A basic characteristic of Islamic legislation. Added to that is the concept of reduction of religious obligation. If you look at the Jewish legal system, 
where they have laws for everything like we do. Their laws are incredibly detailed. You find the Islamic laws has reduced much of those obligations down to major areas. So when somebody says to you, you know this religion of yours, Islam, so many laws, I want for everything. You can do, you can't do, you can't do, you can't do, you can't eat this, you can do that, you can't go here. You... So many laws, your life is so restricted. Where is the freedom? Where's the freedom? Well, we say, well, what do you mean by freedom? Freedom to do anything you want? Is there a society on the earth where you're free to do anything you want? Or does every society have laws? Yes, every society has laws. So there's no place where you are free. Everywhere there are restrictions. And in fact, the things which are prohibited in Islam are few. If you add up all of the prohibited foods, and then you look at all of the permitted foods, hey, the prohibited is only a drop in a, an ocean, a small amount. What is permitted is far greater. And that's the reality. The obligations which Allah prescribes for us, they are few. Now, what we find when we look in these obligations, is that they are for the general welfare of society. They are for the general welfare of society. You see in the Islamic legal uh, pronouncements that human need, human welfare is addressed. So that when somebody comes to you and they say, you know it says in the newspaper that the doctors from years ago, and they repeat it, every so often doctors have pointed out that if you drink half a glass of wine with your meal it helps with digestion it helps in digesting your food this is fact it's a medical fact furthermore they some have even argued that those who drink that half a glass of wine with their meals it reduces the chances for heart attack it's reduced. You say, that's, that's very nice. However, if we put those benefits, help in digestion, reduced chances of heart attack by point so and so and so and so percent, minute reduction, then we put on the other hand, the devastation caused by the use of alcohol in society, we have to say that benefit is of no value. Better we don't consider that benefit at all. It is of no value. When you compare it to the harm, the harm is so overwhelmingly great that that benefit is insignificant. And again, some people will say, okay, we can understand that. However, the harm which comes from alcohol is when people drink in excess. If I only drink my reg, you know, glass of wine with my meal, why do you want to prohibit me from drinking? I will not drinking and getting drunk and killing people with my car or committing heinous crimes, etc. Why are you going to prohibit me? Prohibit those who abuse it. And anything which is abused becomes bad. It's a line of reasoning. What we say, if we were to make the law such that those people who drink in excess are prohibited from drinking alcohol and those who will drink moderately are allowed. Do you think anybody is going to admit that they will drink in excess? Of course not. Everybody will say, yeah, we're moderate drinkers. We'll be moderate. This is something pleasurable. 
Everybody will want to enjoy it. But the reality is that for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people, when they drink, no matter how moderate they are, sometime they become drunk. At some time they will become drunk. You ask the most moderate of drinkers, have you ever become drunk in your life? They will tell you yes, if they're honest. Because though you may be a moderate drinker, all it takes is an incident in your life where you become down, you feel bad, something happened, and then you, that moderate drinker, now drink to excess. And all it takes is once. And you become an enemy to society. Where the most heinous of crimes are committed in states of intoxication. When you read about a father raping his four-year-old daughter, you, and you say, God, how could somebody do this? He was intoxicated. This is why Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Khamru Ummul Khabaith. Intoxicate you, that rare minority. We will take away your right to that pleasure to protect the great majority. Human welfare. The welfare of the society as a whole is given precedence over the desires and the pleasures of the individual. Similarly, polygamy or polygyny, correct name in Islam. The question is usually raised by Muslims and non-Muslims. When a woman's husband takes a second wife, isn't it hurtful for her? Doesn't she feel hurt? Why would Islam permit something wherein there is hurt for women? It's not to say there are not a minority of women who don't have a problem. Your husband have a second wife, no problem. Minority. The vast majority have a problem. They are jealous. It hurts them. So why would Islam permit, why would Allah legislate something in which there is harm to women? We know it must be because the benefit which comes from polygyny far outweighs the harm which comes from polygyny to women. It far outweighs it. Meaning that if we have a society wherein we say monogamy is the law, Monogamy. Everybody has to be monogamous. And the laws of monogamy came from Greece and Rome. They're not intrinsic to Christianity. They came from Greek and Roman law. Greece and Rome, where a man was only allowed to marry one woman, but he could have as many concubines as he wished. So where was the monogamy? There wasn't any monogamy. Monogamy didn't as exist then and it doesn't exist now. Because surveys done of married males in North America, in England, in Europe, have shown that the vast majority have had extramarital affairs. The vast majority have had extramarital affairs. That's the nice way of saying they committed adultery. So, where is the monogamy? 
Polygamy is being practiced. Wherever you go on the face of this earth, polygamy is the norm. What Islam came and did was it regulated polygamy, set systems, guidelines, rights, obligations in that context. So the benefit, the benefit is that it provides a means where the natural inclinations of males may be fulfilled within the bounds of the law. Wherein the rights of women and children are protected. This is the principle. So, whenever we look at these various laws, we should try to understand within them wherein lies the realization of public welfare. That is the nature, fundamental principle governing Islamic law. So when people complain and they say, you know, as the Taliban have done and they do in Saudi Arabia, this thing of hacking off people's hands, you know, they don't just say amputating, they will either say hacking off people's hands, you know, or chopping off people's hands. They give you the idea that you take a meat chopper, a meat cleaver, and you're crack, crack, crack. Actually, you tear off the person's hand or you get a uh, saw and you're sawing off their hands. This is, I always try to put it in the worst scenario. Right? Yes, this is, you know, for the crime they've committed, well, public welfare. Again, this is the principle. That by removing that person's hand, the society is protected from his harm. There is deterrence there. Either you know that if you steal, you're going to lose your hand. So you think twice and thrice before you steal. Or you go ahead and steal and you got caught and you lost your hand. You'll think twice and thrice and four times and five times before you steal again. Because you might lose your leg next time, right? Okay, so. so just the application of that principle is enough. To achieve for the society this state of security. This is one of the things which uh, impressed many of the American troops that were there after the Gulf War. Who were, you know, we were, I said, I mentioned before that myself and some other brothers were involved in a Dawah program amongst them for some five months, five and a half months, explaining Islam to them and so on and so on. And over 3,000 of them accepted Islam. A number of them, one of the, among the reasons which led them to accept Islam was the fact that they used to come in off maneuvers you know, out in the desert or whatever and they would come into the city in the Mam, which stayed open normally things would close up around midnight but they would stay open like 24 hours because of business and they would be able to walk downtown Damam, which is like, it looks like, you know, American city built up, buildings, all this kind of thing, stores all open. They will be able to walk down, men or women, able to walk down the streets by themselves, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and not fear anything. They could buy gold, wear it on their hands, gold chains, of course, these guys gonna buy all these gold chains, and walk in the streets, no problem. Hey, if you did that in New York City, or Chicago, man, they chop off your hand to get to those rings. <laughs> you know, you'd be finished in a moment. So they, they, this is one of the things that really impressed them. You know, the, the level of security where the society, they went into people's homes, would take them into people's homes, and they didn't see any latches. You know, of course, when people come home in big cities in America, you, you got a whole, you know, a uh, series of uh, lockdown maneuvers that you have to go through. You know, you lock up, you press the buttons, and you slatch, and you, you know. And if you forget, and you wake up in the middle of the night, oh my God, you're running back down the street, you're making sure you're, your life is in a state of insecurity. <laughs> right? You know. So, this is the product. And they ask, why? We tell them, because 
hands are cut off. I said, Pff. make sense. Make sense. You know. So always whenever we deal with these types of issues, which when we understand the underlying principles, the issues become clear. When we don't understand the underlying principles, then of course from a Western perspective you look at these things, it does seem to be rather harsh. Rather harsh. And the last of the major principles that may be deduced from the Islamic legal system primarily from the Quran but also from the Sunnah both being from Revelation is what we call the realization of universal justice and this was exemplified by the incident in the Prophet life in which a woman from the Makhzum tribe had stolen something and she was from the upper class of the society she was caught. Her hand was to be cut off. So they went to Usama ibn Zaid, the former, uh, we would say, grandson of the adopted son of the Prophet Muhammad Zaid ibn Haritha. They went to him due to some position of influence they had and they asked him to intercede on her behalf so Osama went to the Prophet ﷺ and put in a word and they went to Osama ibn Zaid why because everybody knew that the Prophet ﷺ loved Osama loved him really you know he was very dear to him so when Usama made this suggestion, the Prophet ﷺ was very upset. He said to him, Usama, would you dare to intercede in the laws that Allah has prescribed? Then he called all the people and he stood up amongst them and he said, O oh people, the people before you were destroyed because when the rich among them stole, they didn't apply the law. But when the poor among them stole, they applied the full force of the law. If my own daughter Fatima stole, I would cut off her hand. That is the concept of universal justice. This is reinforced in many of the verses in the Quran where Allah says, for example, O you who believe, Stand out firmly for Allah as witnesses to fair dealing. And do not let the hatred of a people cause you not to be just. Be just, for it is closer to piety. And fear Allah, for verily Allah is well aware of whatever you do. So, this principle of universal justice uh, insists that Islamic law be applied equally to all. Everybody is governed by the law. There is none above the law. That doesn't mean that you may not find a Muslim society which claims to be applying Islamic law, but they have sections that are above the law. This happens, but that is proof that they are not applying Islamic law as it should be. They are applying a part of it and they are not applying another part. So we always judge these kind of situations based on not what people do, but what they are supposed to do. Now, as an example, of the application of Qiyas and there are a number of examples in the book based on our time frame I will not go into each and every one of them 
the most obvious example of chaos in our times wherein its application has changed is that concerning the laws governing smoking right you hear the usual controversy among people is it makru isn't it makru some people saying it's haram is it haram it's not in the quran so how could it be haram muslims have always said it was makru how can somebody come along today and say it's haram well if we look at the history of tobacco and of course it came from north america taken back to europe by sir walter raleigh smoking out of a pipe clay pipes eventually it worked its way among the upper class to ottoman turkey in around the 16th or 17th century and when it came among the ottomans and people began to use it or people wanted to use it the scholars of the time had to address how this act would be categorized because everything in islam is falls under one of the rulings either it is haram prohibited or it's wajib you must do it or it is mustahab you are recommended to do it or it's makru it's this dislike for you to do it or it's neutral whether you do it you don't do it all the same so they had to find a ruling for it they observed those who smoked what was the consequence what was the effects of smoking the the only discernible negative effect because of course that's what they're looking for negative effects if there are no negative effects it's it's okay because the general ruling for foods and dress and things which are not connected directly with the religion is that it is all okay unless it has been specifically prohibited that's the general ruling whereas when we deal with religious acts the ruling changes it is all forbidden unless there is specific instructions to permit it that law of change is why because innovation in religion is prohibited so the law has to function like that whereas innovation in our daily lives is encouraged that's why the law functions the other way so they were looking for harm and what they found was that smoking causes the bad breath of the smokers that's what they could see when they smoked the breath changed and the well-known smoker's breath occurred bad so what was the ruling what would be the ruling on things which cause bad breath they went back into the sharia to look to see what did allah have to say and they found in the statement of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam anyone who eats raw onions or raw garlic should not come to our mosques Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibited people who eat raw garlic and raw onions from coming to the mosque when you eat it before coming doesn't mean if you eat it any time last year you can't come to the mosque no. just if you're eating it before coming to the mosque why because of the harm here's your general welfare you're looking about again right general welfare in the salah when we finish the salah we turn to each other saying what assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah i say yeah. you know after eating garlic and onions this becomes harm we are harming our brothers here and our sisters so prophet sam said stay home better you stay home now what is happening when he said stay home and don't pray in the masjid he is depriving you of 27 times more blessing 
isn't it? Because prayer in the masjid is 25 to 27 times more than praying by yourself at home. So when eating raw onions or garlic will cause you to lose those additional benefits, this, the rule eating of raw onions and garlic became makru, disliked. Not haram, not forbidden, but disliked. Disliked why? Because it is depriving, it will deprive you of additional reward. So, makru. So they said, okay, the bad breath of the smoker is like the bad breath of those who eat raw onions and garlic. So we rule that smoking is makru. 500 years ago, scholars ruled it was makru. But we all know that the Surgeon General of the United States of America in 1979 announced to the American public that it has been conclusively shown that smoking causes cancer. Conclusively. This is after a long fight, a long struggle. The tobacco companies paid their scientists to fight that body of information that was accumulating, pointing towards this fact. Because actually scientists said that way back. But they didn't have absolute conclusive evidence. So the tobacco companies, they paid scientists big money to stand up and say, no, it is not definite. It may appear or there seems to be, but we don't have conclusive evidence. Now when the Surgeon General brought it to that point, this is now when the evidence became so overwhelming that no credible scientist would dare to stand up and say it is not conclusively proven. He would, to do that, remove any credibility he had in the scientific world. The evidence was overwhelming. So the statement was made. And of course we all know the history, a whole change in America, smoking started on the decline. Cigarette packs written there, this is hazardous to health, this can cause cancer, all these different kinds of things. So, Muslim scholars who were not locked into tradition, right? They are the traditionalist, factionalist scholars who are locked into tradition and factionalism, where this is what our scholars said 500 years ago, we will go with this ruling until the last day. This is ignorance. This is from fiqh. This is not sharia. That ruling was not revelation. That was applied revelation based on the knowledge of the times. Once the knowledge changes, then we now must go back into the sunnah and look to see what is there in the sunnah and in the Quran to address substances which cause cancer, illness, and we know cancer causes death. We have a different situation here now. And of course, the Quran prohibits it. لا تقتلوا أنفسكم Don't kill yourselves. Prophet ﷺ prohibited, prohibited it, saying that whoever kills himself will find himself in the hellfire, killing himself perpetually. So every, all the evidence said that these type of substances are haram. So the scholars that were progressive scholars, were not locked into traditionalism, they immediately changed the ruling and said smoking is haram. Sheikh bin Baz was among those leading scholars. He wrote about four books proving that smoking is haram. So, some people say, well, who says really that smoking kills? Now we know this, uh, the, the, the old lady who lived to the, to the age of 113 in China, she used to smoke a cigar every day. So it's not necessary that you smoke, you will die. 
we say again, do we make our laws according to exceptions or do we make it according to the general rule? The general rule is that those who smoke get cancer and die. The Marlborough man is dead. He died from lung cancer. His wife is suing the Marlborough company for killing him. Okay, that's the reality. And we in our lives function according to the general rule. We don't function according to the exception. When we have to make decisions, we make our rulings according to the general rule. For example, I have a photograph of this guy sitting in a wheelchair. Right? He has his two thumbs up like that, a big smile on his face. He's sitting in the wheelchair, but he has a big smile, two thumbs up. The caption underneath, he was a parachutist, jumped out of the airplane, 40,000 feet or whatever, pulled his ripcord, no shoot. Pulled his backup, shoot, no shoot. He fell some 36,000 feet and he lived to tell about it. There he was in the wheelchair, maybe almost every bone in his body was broken, but he came through it. Allahu Akbar. Now, when you go on the airplane and you're going to do parachuting, are you going to jump out and say, perhaps I will be like that guy? <laughs> or are you going to strap yourself down with four shoots? You understand? To make sure you don't find yourself in that same situation. That's the reality. That's how we function. We don't go according to the exception. We go according to the rule. Right? Other people, they argue, hey, it's not suicide. I don't take a cigarette, smoke it, and I drop down dead. You now people commit suicide. They kill themselves. It's clear. We say, there is no difference. Whether you kill yourself in an instant, or you kill yourself after a period of time. If every day you take an eyedropper, and you drop in your orange juice, in your breakfast, one drop of poison. And at the end of the year, it accumulates in your body and you finally drop down dead. Is that any different from you taking that full glass of poison and killing yourself in one shot? No. Because you are taking something which you knew would kill you. So whether it happens instantly or it happens after a period of time, it's all the same. The act of taking something Knowing that it will kill you, this is an act fundamentally of suicide. So, smoking, the correct ruling with regards to smoking is that it is haram. And we can see the flexibility also in Islamic law concerning qiyas, wherein if somebody told you you are a diabetic, and the doctor informs you that if you take sugar, you will become comatose and you will die. Then for you, sugar is haram. Though it is halal for everybody else, for you it is haram. Okay, that's how the law is applied. One more point before I stop here for a break. And we won't be able to take questions right now. We'll just deal with the questions after because we have to cover material. One more point is that the principle with regards to intoxicants. When we have to determine whether a substance can be taken or not, we have medicines, foods, drinks, etc., which may have in them 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 or 0.2 percent alcohol, it's written on the label. Can we take these substances or not? When we go back to the Sunnah and the Quran, of course the Quran says clearly we should avoid intoxicants. 
فَجْتَنِبُوا Don't even come near it. What does that mean? It, one could deduce from that that it means that if there is any alcohol in anything, anywhere, don't even come near them. What about antifreeze? It's alcohol. <laughs> we use it to stop the cars from freezing up and being able to... Antifreeze is alcohol. So when we say don't come near it, it means don't come near it with regards to drinking it, consuming it. Not that you may not use it, you know, to clean. You have, you know, rubbing alcohol. You have cleaning alcohol, and we have to be careful. Chemically, there are things which we call alcohol merely because they have the OH molecule. This is a chemical title. It doesn't mean that if you take this, you'll get intoxicated. Maybe it'll kill you, make you blind, and you're still not intoxicated. <laughs> you understand? So you don't take these things because they're harmful. I mean, that's the general principle, right? But it, and though we call it alcohol, it doesn't necessarily mean it's alcohol in the sense intended by the Sharia. So when we go into the Sunnah, we find a principle there stated by the Prophet Muhammad ما أسكر كثيره فقليله حرام Whatever intoxicates in large amounts, it is forbidden in small amounts. Whatever intoxicates in large amounts is forbidden in small amounts. Now, what people understood from that is that that medicine, that cake or this uh, flavoring or whatever which has 0.0% alcohol, there it is, haram. Because you take a large quantity of, of alcohol, it's haram. It'll get you intoxicated, it's haram. But is that what the law meant? Is that what was meant by the law? Some people say yes. Some people say no. So, how do we know? We again go back to whom? To the Sahaba. How did the Sahaba understand that? They said, and this is Sahih Bukhari, we used to take our drinks to Rasulullah Sallallahu Our Nabiz, which is fermented drinks, to Rasulullah Sallallahu and ask him, can we drink these drinks? And he told us that if it intoxicates, you are not allowed to drink it. So, we used to drink Nabiz for the first two or three days. After that, we threw it away. Because in the first two or three days, when the fermentation process started, it was not intoxicant, it had a tang to it. But if you drank it, you didn't get intoxicated. But by the third day, now the alcohol content in it had reached a level where you drank it, you'd get intoxicated, so that they wouldn't take it after that. But what does this mean? It means that from the first day, when fermentation began, alcohol was present. Alcohol was present. So, if a substance has a percentage of alcohol, we don't use that to determine whether halal or haram, no. Vinegar has alcohol. Every bottle of vinegar you buy on the market has a percentage of alcohol. Because vinegar is made from alcohol. You start with fruit juice or whatever and then it ferments into alcohol. And after reaching the state of alcohol it continues fermentation until it becomes vinegar. But in the process some alcohol will be in that vinegar because it will not transform 100% and vinegar we know is halal
because no matter how many bottles of vinegar you drink, you're not going to get intoxicated. So similarly, what is meant by what intoxicates in small amounts, in large amounts is forbidden in small amounts. What this means is that vodka, if you drink a glass of it, you get intoxicated. Or depending, you know, if you are a heavy drinker, it may take five glasses, right? But you will get intoxicated, you drink a bunch of it. To take a teaspoonful of it is haram. You just pour it in a teaspoon. I'm not drinking enough now to get intoxicated. Only a teaspoon. That is haram. Because you fill the glass and get intoxicated, so haram. That's the principle. Now the medicine, which has 0.1% of alcohol, if you drank five bottles of it, you drank ten bottles of it, you are not getting intoxicated. You will drink it until you drown yourself in it and you will still not be intoxicated. It is not haram. It's not haram. The flavoring, which ends up in cake or whatever, there is this minute percentage. That flavoring, if you pour it into a glass and you drink so many glasses of this stuff, vanilla extract, you drink them. Are you ever going to get intoxicated from vanilla extract? No. Then it's not haram. Rabutessins. Yes. Rabutessins is known. Right? Those who are involved in drugs, whenever they can't get drugs, you go and you buy yourself a few bottles of Rabutessins, you drink it up and you do get intoxicated. So Rabutessins is haram. That is the principle. You understand? This is qiyas in operation here. Where that principle of intoxication exists, then this substance is haram. Where the principle doesn't exist, it is not haram. Now, can Muslims produce something, a product, which involves them adding minute quantities of alcohol to it? No. We can't, because it means you have to produce alcohol or buy alcohol, so for you to make it, if this substance you're making, for example, you're making vanilla extract. To make the vanilla extract, you blend some alcohol and, you know, you put your substance in it which uh, acts as a catalyst, whatever, but in your end product, that percentage of alcohol does remain. You can't make that because it means you have to buy alcohol or make alcohol. That is haram. It is haram to even grow grapes with the intention of selling it to people who are going to make alcohol. That's haram. So we can't do it. But if you go to the marketplace and the non-Muslims are selling vanilla extract, you can buy it. Though you couldn't produce it because there are certain restrictions on you, if it exists on the market, it exists in trade, you can purchase it and you can use it. Is that point clear? Hmm? Very, very important point because I think it's confused in the minds of many, many people. And as such, they created you know, difficulties for themselves, which was not intended by the Sharia.